Hi guys, I hope you all can see my screen and I'm audible to all. Okay, so uh, guys, please note, we'll wait for more five to 10 minutes. Like if participants are still joining, they can get in. So we'll wait for other participants as well. I repeat, those who have joined just now, please note, we'll wait for more five to 10 minutes and we'll start the webinar.
participants are requested to note that we are waiting for more participants to get in. Those who have connected just now, please note we are waiting for other participants to join the webinar. We'll start the webinar in a few minutes. I repeat, we are waiting for more participants to join the webinar. And we'll start the webinar in a few minutes. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so we are good to start now. Hello and welcome to all. Myself, Chaitali, your host for this AZ900 webinar. So guys, please note this will be a full day training on AZ900 Microsoft as your fundamental. Uh, you can use your chat box for your queries or your questions. Uh, I will be there and the speaker will be there to help you out. Then moving ahead, talking about our today's event sponsor, Synergetics. So Synergetics is India's one of a kind corporate learning solution company. As you all know, we do provide certification and uh, trainings on the solutions like onboarding add-on solution, persona based onboarding solution, certification solution, certification plus add-on solution, latest technology training solution and emerging technology training solution. So today's webinar comes under certification and certification plus add-on solution. Then you can get trained, build your co confidence and get recognized through this certification. So this is the journey path. 
to uh, to completing the certification microsoft certification as you can see you just have to go for the fundamental first then you can appear for advanced level certifications these are the certification benefits to the organization like you can enhance the brand reputation add the profit to the business and build a competitive advantages for your organization then scaling journey path as you can see over here uh, first you have to complete the fundamental uh, level certification then you can appear for advanced rule base and expert level certifications we do provide fundamental certifications right like az900 as your fundamentals then ai900 as your ai fundamentals dp900 as your data fundamental pl900 power platform fundamental and sc900 security compliance and identity fundamental then we have role based certification on AZ104 that is Azure Administrator Associate, AZ204 as your Developer Associate, AI102 as your AI Engineer Associate, and all. Then the expert level certification on which we do training, such as AZ305, then we have SC100. PL 600 and AZ 400. So these are the certifications uh, on which we do provide training. Synergetics do provide training. So if you want to know more about it and you want to get trained through us, you can just connect uh, on the given details. We'll share the details in the chat box for you all. Then our certification offerings. So you can expand your knowledge and skill as well to this offerings. Then the Azure Tech community. So Azure Tech, uh, this uh, event is sponsored and handled by Azure Tech community. Under this communities, we have communities like Emerging Technology Community. Then we have Azure Tech Community Pune for Punekas. Emerging Technology Community for Surat. Azure Tech Community Nagpur for Nagpurkas. So what you all have to do is you just have to install the meetup app on your phone or on your device. To get this like you can follow these communities. You can get these communities over there. I will share the uh, community links in the chat box for you all. So you can go and connect us over there. Then code of conduct. No one is allowed to take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen recording. Please note this uh, recording will be uploaded on our official YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel link will be given to you all in the chat box later on. Then speaker for this webinar is Ms. Manshi Shani. She is an MCT and trainer consultant. Then the agenda for this webinar. So we'll get an overview of the certification and more. Also, we are giving a complimentary badge in this training. So for that, you have to follow certain steps. You have to create your Microsoft profile, Microsoft Learn profile. Once you create that profile, uh, you will get a URL with the steps. You have to just click on that URL and get your batch activated. Under this batch, you will get a study material. 
for AC 900, like you will get an overview of the certifications and modules, and you will get a journey path inside it. Also, you can share this batch on your LinkedIn and Twitter profile. Then do follow us on our official social media, social media platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. I will share the links for you all in the chat box so you can go and follow us over there. That's all. Thank you all. Now I would like to hand over the mic to the speaker. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Maxi, thank you, Chaitali. Yeah, thank you, Chaitali, for the uh, introduction. A very good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Manasi Shahani, and I will be the trainer for today. And our topic is learning about the fundamentals on Azure cloud fundamentals on Azure. So I just want to do a quick poll, okay? Um, how many of you all are familiar with cloud, have any uh, idea as to what is cloud? Because over these five, six years, you know, cloud has gained a lot of momentum, okay? And I'm pretty sure many of you all know, like, why, what is cloud? And just... Uh, and I just want an understanding or just a brief idea uh, uh, about what uh, do you all know cloud? Have you all heard about it? Okay, fine. What about the rest? I just see two people. Great. So I see a lot of people have knowledge of uh, cloud. That's great. OK, but uh, the ones who do not have any knowledge, don't worry. Th that is what this training is about. OK, you are going to um, know about the fundamentals of cloud and you're going to understand what is Azure cloud. OK, in um, in little detail. OK, uh, and this particular certification or this particular training, OK, will let you or will lead you to select one of the paths uh, that you want to specialize in cloud. So cloud in general is very vast. OK, and there are lots and lots of services that you can use and specialize in. OK, so it is some it is something that is really really fantastic to venture in okay it is i mean if you are aware of it you can do lots and lots of things it's not just administration but you can go in other technologies as well so great i can see a lot of people have understanding of cloud and they are currently working as well and they are aware about aws OK, so let's start. I'll just give you a brief introduction on what is AZ 900 and why you here for today and um, what kind of a, uh, what what am I going to teach you today is what I'm going to first show you all. OK. Chaitali, am I audible? Yes, Mansi, I can hear you. Yeah, just give me one minute. Yeah, so uh Sorry, a lot of background. Okay. Uh, how does this come? Mm -hmm. 
we are not talking. Okay, so Chaitali, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Or can you guys confirm whether my screen is visible yes, or not? Yes, it is visible. Okay, great, great. So, like I said, uh, our training is today's training is about uh, AZ 900. So, what is AZ 900? Uh, it's a certification, uh, a fundamental certification that Microsoft has introduced. Okay, um, for people who want to learn cloud, it's just a basic fundamental uh, certification just to get you introduced to cloud. Okay, uh, it's not a advanced certification where you do take one technology and learn in depth. OK, so this particular certification has bits and pieces of each and every technology that is available on Azure. OK, so why 900? I don't know, but uh, all their fundamental Microsoft certification fundamentals are um, of uh, 900. So like Chaitali showed you all in the beginning, DP 900, AI 900, AZ 900, SC 900. These are all the fundamental certifications that Azure or Microsoft provides. Now coming to this course, okay. Uh, like I've been telling you all, this is all about cloud, okay. And um, it's going to be a basic, um, very basic uh, training today about cloud. It's not it's not an advanced role based certification that we are doing. Okay, it's something that will introduce all the cloud tech, cloud understanding. What what is uh, cloud? What is the different basic concepts of cloud on Azure? Okay, and apart from that, I will be uh, telling your. I will be uh, giving an exam prep session. How you can prepare for this uh, certification. OK, I will be telling you all some sample questions. I will be showing you all from each module. OK, um, and if you all want to give this certification, you all can give it. It's a very basic certification. OK, and how you from where you can prepare. Are there any practice tests? All that information I will also be sharing in this training. So coming to this uh, uh, sorry, uh, course and like I like you can read here, there is no prerequisite. OK, but having some knowledge about the computers and the IT background is good enough. OK, if you don't know coding, no worries. It's not good. It's, it's something that you're not going to use it over here. OK, because like I said, it's a very fundamental uh, certification. So, of course, coding is not expected. Okay. And once we do the exam prep session, I will tell you all more about it. Okay. But a little understanding of uh, computers, servers, all of this is great to know. Then this course is divided into three parts. Okay, the very first part is cloud concepts. Okay, we are going to see the fundamental cloud concepts. What is cloud? Why do you need cloud? What was the scenario before cloud? Okay, of course, people were, you know, working, deploying applications, right? Before cloud came into picture. So what was the scenario? Then what were the challenges that one faced? Okay, when uh, there was no cloud and what cloud overcame? How did it, you know, uh, overcame those challenges that people faced before cloud came? OK, then uh, what are the different services, models, all of this we are going to see in module one. Then in second module, we are going to see what is the architecture. We are going to move into uh, understanding Azure. Once we have understood the cloud fundamentals, we are going to apply those concepts on Azure, understand different services, what is the architecture of Azure. And then finally, we are going to look at how to manage costs. OK, what are the governance policies, regulations? OK, because um, the cloud is available to people across the globe, right? There are different countries. Different countries have their own regulations, their own standards. OK, so Azure needs to follow them. So we are going to see how uh, that is done. OK, and apart from that, uh, what? how can you give your own policies? OK, how can you manage your own Azure is what we are going to see in module 
three. So coming to the exam perspective, okay. Uh, if you plan to give the exam, okay, in future or after this training, okay. So you need to know which module has what percentage, okay. Now, what do I mean by percentage? Like from this section, how many or what? How many questions are expected is what we will be seeing. OK, so here you can see the second module has the highest percentage that is 35 to 40 percent. So expect a lot of questions from this section. OK, then the second section is the third module and then the first module. So you can see like around, you know, the distribution or the weightage is almost the same uh, for all the three modules. If I have to talk about it. OK, so each and every module is very important. OK in itself so you can expect questions from all sections then if you want to practice or you want to learn anything okay you microsoft uh, learn has a sandbox so you can go create a, a account on it and you can do the labs online itself you don't need to you know uh, install any software you don't need to have a cloud uh, subscription at the beginning okay so if you want to uh, just uh, practice any labs you can do that using the sandbox that microsoft offers so this is just a general introduction as to what i'm going to do in this training okay so let's start with module one so before we start module one i have a question for you guys can you all tell me what was the scenario before cloud came? How were people deploying applications? How were people, you know, uh, making their websites available online? Can you just tell me what was the medium? How were people doing it? Because before cloud came in, there were websites, right? We were having lots of websites. How do you think people were doing it? <clears throat> Yes, on point, guys. You guys, you have answered perfectly. Okay, so before cloud came in, okay, people, what they were doing is, let's say I have a website, okay, that I want to make it available to people, okay, to the general population, okay. So what people, what uh, developers used to do, they used to buy a set of servers, okay. Uh, if you can't hear anything, I will recommend uh, you please join the meeting again. Check your internet connection because I can see people can hear me because they are giving answers in the chat box. So I would recommend you to uh, join the meeting again or check your or join through any uh, some other device. OK. Um, so uh, when people, like I said, when people used to deploy their websites, so they would buy their own servers, correct? And on those servers, they would make their application or website available to the public. Yes, okay. So what do you think um, uh, was it like? Do you think the servers that were there were easy to buy. Could all can all the developers or the organization like afford to buy servers that time? Right. No, not all of them could afford, right? So <clears throat> and you know servers if you have to buy you need to give it a dedicated space you need to give it a team right who will maintain those servers who will look after those servers and uh, and then of course servers have a tendency to become hot right they because you have to keep them um uh, running 24 7 365 days so that your website or your application is available so they will tend to become hot they will overheat so you need to cool them down you need to buy acs you need to pay for the electricity correct don't you think these were the costs that is incurred when you buy or uh, deploy servers <clears throat> correct so what if now I say, OK, big organizations can still manage it. 
let's say Microsoft could manage it, uh, Amazon could manage it, Oracle could manage all the big server, big uh, companies could manage it. But what if it's a start startup? Let's say I have uh, uh, I have started a company of my own. Do you think will I have that much cost? OK, will I have that much investment at the beginning so that I can afford servers? OK, not just servers, not just the hardware. OK, but keep a team dedicated to maintain the servers, to maintain, uh, to pay that much electricity, to pay that much, to pay, um, to pay for the electricity, maintaining the ACs. What if the ACs go down? What if one server goes down? Do you think a startup could afford that time? Do you think any com any person will have that much investment like a big company or tech giants will have? Let's say you want to start, you want to deploy your website. You want to, um, yeah, they should have good funding, right? But what if they don't? Then what? But still they have a website and they want it to be available to the public. They want to uh, use it so that people can come to their website for any purpose, whether it's an e-commerce website or it's um, for some uh, shop, it's a shopping website for some clothing apparel, then what? Then this becomes a challenge. Earlier people, what were the challenges that people needed to buy the infrastructure and the infrastructure was not easy or and it was expensive to procure. Right, along with infrastructure, you have the maintenance. Okay, time and ahead of plan. You need to plan ahead. Now, let's say I give you an example. Um, what if on uh, the weekend? Okay, my. Um, what if let's say uh, over the weekend, my uh, website is facing or is generating a lot of traffic traffic? Sorry. Then what? What will happen? I have, let's say, just 10 servers to manage the website. And suddenly over a weekend or let's say it's a holiday. OK, it's 15th August or Diwali has come in. What do you think? Will my 10 servers be able to manage those that traffic over the weekend? No, right? What will happen? People will. There will be a delay. You will lose people. People will not. You will lose all the traffic that has come in, right? So now if I have to manage that traffic, then what will I have to do? What uh, in order to manage so much traffic, what do you have to do? You will don't you think you will buy more servers? You need to buy more capacity, add more infrastructure. Don't you think you'll have to? Yes, absolutely right. Expand, scale up. Correct. You need to buy or procure more infrastructure. Don't you think so? So can you plan ahead in time? OK, uh, I am going to get this much traffic. I am going my servers are going to have are going to be uh, used fully now. But what if it's a weekday? My servers are sitting idle and I have purchased 10 more servers which I'm not using. Do you can you figure out a way to use them? Then what are you doing? Those 10 servers are remaining idle, right? How, how you then again, you will have to spend more on the electricity, more you'll have to give the team that is maintaining that server, right? You'll have to uh, expand your room where you have kept those servers. Only 10 servers could fit in. Now you have to give more room for 10 more servers. Do you think it will be possible? To do that in a day's time or in two days, it takes time, right? So could you plan ahead? Could you do any planning? Could a startup or even a big organization do that planning? OK, today the load is this much. Tomorrow the load will be this much. Next week my load will go down. No, right? You can't do that if you are uh, if you do if you did not have cloud if you were required to buy your own servers then 
apart length this is the same thing when there is no utilization of your infrastructure what are they what are they sitting do and doing there they are nothing but idle right you are unnecessarily paying for the electricity you are unnecessarily paying to the team that is maintaining these servers correct so in a way you are spending more and you are there is no traffic that is coming to your website so don't you think there'll be a loss right you are just spending and you are just uh, lots and lots of uh, capital you are putting in but no return to it right so you couldn't do this before cloud came into picture okay since cloud came in okay and i will be telling you all about it it brought in the a term called as elasticity it brought in something called as elasticity so guys i just want to ask you like do you all get electricity at home you all use fans lights then ac your how do you how do you think it comes it comes through electricity right so when you are using your lights fans charging your laptops running your wifi so the period for which you are using the uh, elect electricity do are you paid like are you charged i'm sorry are you billed for it we get a monthly electricity bill right even if you have switched on a fan switched on an ac you get a bill right so are you charged for it so if you do not turn on switch on the ac you do not switch on the fan you do not switch on your wifi do not charge your laptop okay so will you be billed for it will you get a electricity bill for it let's say you were out for uh, away on a vacation for a week or so and you have not switched on your wifi charged your laptop right so do you get do you get paid for the time you did not switch on your ac or your any of the electrical appliance you get charged for it i'm surprised which which company does that unless you keep on the uh, appliance on do you do you are you charged for it because when i don't switch on which if my fan if my electricity is i'm not using it you you are you are so you are not supposed to charge you are not supposed to be charged for it or billed for it right only if you so the moment you switch on the uh, switch on the lights or fan from that moment you will be charged till the time you use it and the moment you stop using it it will sh it shouldn't charge you right it shouldn't bill you right and little bit savings you do on that electricity so that's what cloud brought in let's say you do not require these 10 servers that you have procured because suddenly the load increased okay on a weekend or on a holiday public holiday let's say you just bought those 10 servers extra servers okay and now the load has gone away you have come back to a non holiday phase okay and people are not there's not much traffic generated on a daily basis on to your website so those 10 servers are sitting idle correct so instead of keeping those 10 servers with you okay what you can do is you can give it back or you can just tell your cloud service provider okay i no longer need this you just send me the bill for how much ever or for the period i have used these servers 
so that's what cloud brought in it brought elasticity okay it brought elasticity with it so the moment you switch on the button your light will switch on your billing will start from there the moment you switch off your lights uh, by switching off the button it will stop charging you for the lights so that's what a cloud got in the moment you need servers you get it you procure it okay you buy them sorry not buy you rent them okay and once you are done you give it back tell it okay i no longer need it you send me the bill for the time period i have used your server so this is what cloud got in and this is what is one of the biggest advantage of cloud okay so what were the challenges earlier you needed to procure infrastructure which cloud now says don't worry i have it take mine and use it second you couldn't time you couldn't plan ahead of time you couldn't predict the future today i have this much load tomorrow i have this much load you cannot predict what if it's a holiday season okay you there is a lot of traffic coming in you can't predict when you have a when you had servers of your own and installation of the servers maintaining those servers increases cost increases uh uh the time that you require to install them but whereas when cloud came in what did it do it said okay you take these servers from me okay i have i already have servers installed with me you take it from me okay i am renting it to you once you're done you give it back to me and what for how much ever time you have used it you pay for it so you did not have to worry about buying more servers renting more servers worrying about the infrastructure when it was the peak time and when it sits idle you did not have to worry about that and along with that you don't have to pay the maintenance team who is maintaining your servers correct you what they will what you it's a one person job then correct only one person sits and he can do it whenever you need the servers he can just tell cloud whenever he does not he can just give it back so this is what cloud computing or cloud got for the developers okay it brought that ease it brought that elasticity okay so that so that you can have lots of people deploying their applications and at a much uh, faster speed okay compared to the traditional way buying the servers installing them giving a dedicated room and then making your application available so what is cloud computing cloud computing is nothing but or oh, create or making your services available over the internet by managing your uh by managing the cost by managing the resources that is the infrastructure and by managing the money or the cost okay so all you need if you have to deploy any service okay on on any of the cloud uh, service providers okay uh, you just need to have a good internet connectivity okay so that's what basically cloud computing got with it okay the challenges that were faced by people okay by developers before it came in and now the most amazing uh, flexibility faster innovation and uh, better management of your cost okay how you can manage your cost so if it's a startup they need not worry now okay they just need a good cloud subscription okay a subscription to a cloud and they can deploy their websites make it available to people and just focus on the coding and a little bit of the infrastructure but not worry about maintaining them correct so uh, at the beginning i asked you all do you all know about cloud and all of that can you name three most popular cloud service providers that we have as of today or any cloud service providers that you all know
Yes, absolutely right. The three most and there are lots of cloud service providers out there. You have Oracle, you have uh, AWS, you have GCP, you have IBM as well, right? They also have their own cloud. Okay, you have lots and lots of service providers over, over here. Yes, okay. But the most popular are Amazon and Azure. Okay, so in this training, like I told you all, we will be learning about Azure. Just one minute. Yes, sorry. So nowadays we have so many cloud service providers. People do not have to buy their own infrastructure, invest, have a lot of capital into them. Okay. And one such popular service is was introduced by Microsoft and it is called as. Yeah, so cloud computing is nothing but running your services over the internet by having the flexibility of resources, managing your resources, managing your cost, managing your any services that you have. All you need is a good, strong internet connectivity. OK, so this is what is. Cloud computing, OK, then the most popular cloud. So if you have to provide cloud to anyone, there has to be people, there has to be an organization responsible for it, correct? Because they have to maintain the servers, the infrastructure, they are responsible to maintain that. And who does that? We have lots of uh, providers nowadays. We have AWS, we have Google Cloud Provider, we have IBM, we have Alibaba, all the things that you are listed. And one such popular cloud service provider was brought in by Microsoft with the name Microsoft Azure. So Azure is. Uh, I will come to that question, OK, which which one should uh, you use? OK, I will talk about it uh, much later, OK? So what is Microsoft Azure? It's nothing but a cloud uh, service that Microsoft provides. OK, you can use their uh, resources, their infrastructure and perform any service. OK, uh, uh, create any service that you want. OK, so Azure is one of the most popular services as of now. And why? Because it is an amazing service to use. And since I have been using it for a couple of years nowadays, I mean, for a lot of years, and I find it so easy. And people who don't have knowledge of cloud, this is the best service. I mean, best cloud you can start with. OK, um, and um, very easy to use. Lots and lots of people use this. OK, um, if the organization doesn't like it, we can't help it. We have to use what they recommend. But if you have a if given a choice, start with Microsoft Azure. It's the easiest to work with. And trust me, I didn't have any knowledge of Azure earlier. When I came into Synergetics, that's when I understood cloud and all. And I fell in love with Microsoft Azure from then. And I have been using it for a, a couple of years. And trust me, the ease that I uh, it's given me the cost management. OK, it's a really, really beautiful platform for people who are venturing into cloud, who have no knowledge of cloud. OK, um, you can see the numbers here. The numbers speak for themselves. OK, there are lots and lots of people who use uh, Microsoft Azure as of today. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, security, in terms of cost, in terms of um, the ease with which you can use this, it, the platform is wonderful. OK, you can you create 
uh, lots and lots of services. You have virtual machines, you have storages, you have databases. The identity services are also fantastic in order to use this particular platform. And it has around 95% customers that are using uh, Microsoft, that are using Azure as of now, and then around 3,400 apps. Okay, are listed already in the uh, Microsoft market. I mean, as your marketplace, I will tell you all what is the marketplace. And then apart from that, there are lots and lots of certifications um, you can do using Azure uh, as the cloud. So as Chaitali showed you all in the beginning, that was some of it that we train people on. But there are lots and lots of certifications. You want to go into IoT. There is a, spe a spe specific certification for that. You want to go into ML AI sector. There is a special certification for that, special track for that. Okay. And then if you want to go into administration or security, there are different certifications for that. Okay. Then lots of uh, messages are done. If you are aware of IoT, there is an event hub. Okay, so around one t terabyte of messages per month, people are processing with it. There are lots of people who are using the uh, databases to store their data, and not just databases, but storage as well. Okay, so we will be seeing these services. Okay, then apart from that. You can see these are the customers that we have. OK, uh, yeah, these you can see on the Azure uh, platform. You will uh, come across this information. OK, then uh, lots of service uh, customers are using. You can see very popular uh, uh, companies are using uh, Azure Cloud. Starbucks is also using. OK, uh, lots of people are getting associated with Microsoft Azure Cloud. OK. Then apart from that, it has a global reach. OK, it is present in 60 plus regions, OK, which is double the number as compared to AWS. I think AWS does not have much presence across the globe as of how Azure has. So it spans across 38 regions worldwide, and it has a very high footprint as compared to my as compared to Amazon. Then there are 600 plus uh, resources or services that are there or people upload. Okay, like I told you all about the marketplace. There are lots of and lots of people who release their applications on Azure. Okay, so if you want, if, I don't know if you have heard of big data analytics. Yes, guys, have you all heard of big data analytics? So I'm pretty sure you are aware of uh, Databricks. Databricks service. You all know what is Databricks? So Databricks is one of uh, uh, one of the the most popular big and data analytics tool, right? So it's a big analytics tool. OK, um, so if you have to process huge amount of data, analyze huge amount of data, OK, so uh, people use uh, uh, there is a Spark engine that has been brought in. OK, and uh, this Spark engine helps you process that data much faster. OK, uh, and for that uh, Databricks. Uh, is a tool. It's a UI based tool, okay, which uses Spark in order to manage your big data, okay. So Databricks has tied up with uh, Azure, okay, and they are providing their service uh, to the existing Azure customers, okay, whoever uses or has. Um, yeah, you can use it for visualization as well. They have brought in that service as well nowadays. OK, so uh, I'm just explaining that third party people also, uh, you know, uh, come in with Azure, OK, and uh, can the ones who already have uh, Azure uh, subscription, they need not go and buy another subscription on some third party uh, uh, website, yeah. So they can um, just use Azure and 
work around with it. Have you heard of open AI, guys? I'm pretty sure chat GPT has become so common nowadays. So many people are using it, right? So what do you need to do with, if you have to use chat GPT, you need to create a separate account on open AI website, right? We need to do that, right? So now since Azure has tied up with OpenAI, they have invested in OpenAI. So the ones who already have Azure, okay, uh, have um, Azure subscription or, um, but Google will have their own uh, uh, service, right? Bard, I don't know, Chat Sonic or something. Okay, but if you want to use Chat GPT, so as if you have an Azure account, Okay, you just have to apply for, uh, uh, you know, it's like an application that you have to send in. Okay, and um, you can uh, register with Azure OpenAI. So you don't have to specifically go and register on chat G on uh, OpenAI or create a uh, login ID over there. You can use Azure for that as well. Okay, so this is what basically uh, lots of third parties do come in with Azure and you can use that as well. You There are lots of services I will list it to you all. Okay, now coming to the cloud benefits, why one should use cloud? Okay, here are some of the um, benefits that I have listed. The very first benefit I've already explained that is elasticity. You do not want any service, you roll it back. You want any infrastructure or uh, resource, you can just ask from the cloud service provider, okay? And uh, it will, you will just get it. And if you don't need it, you can give it back, okay? And you can, you just have to pay for the uh, time you have used this service, okay? That's what is elasticity, okay? Then coming to high availability. So many of you all use, they all use Instagram, Facebook or something like that. You all use some social media account. Okay. <laughs> what about the rest? I'm pretty sure you all might be using some, or oh, okay, let's say any application WhatsApp. I'm pretty sure many of you all use WhatsApp or even Microsoft Teams or Zoom on your mobile, right? You use application or you use some, or you go to some website, right? So tell me if that website is not responding or there is some latency in order to, you know, get that website um, or you, um, of, you know, you have good internet connectivity and all of that, but that website you're not receiving. Do you like to be waited? Oh God, why is this website not coming? I am waiting it for five minutes. After five minutes, who loads the website? Why is the website not coming to me? Do you, do you get, would you get irritated with it? I do, I don't have any patience. I want things to be done quickly. So I'm pretty sure since this world is so fast moving, Okay, we want things to be available. I'm just giving an example, guys. I just want to explain this concept. Okay, so we don't like waiting for things, right? We want things available at, as quickly as possible, right? We want to, uh, we want, we are booking a taxi. We don't want after one hour the taxi is coming, right? We have to go now to one place. So we need the taxi now, right? We don't like to, even for food we at a restaurant, we don't like waiting. We want it in like 15 minutes or so and after we place the order, right? So if I tell you all, if somebody has deployed an application on cloud and after five minutes or something, the application is being available to that person, will that person like your website? Will he come to your website? Will your website generate traffic? Do you think people will like it? No, right? So people need things that are highly available or are available with very little latency. So that's what cloud brings in. It has just one minute, guys.
Yes, guys. Don't you want things to be highly available like a website or an application? What if I say WhatsApp is not available to you? The servers were down there. Will you all like it? I think some time ago, Instagram was down for, for a day or so. Don't you think people, your, your application or your website will face, um, you will lose on a lot of things. You will lose on the cost. Your, um, pro there will be no profit for that time, no income for that time. Do you think you are, uh, as a developer, when you're developing a website or an application, will you like it? Like my cloud service provider, okay, uh, for some reason, my servers are down. They are not functioning. Do you think your application will be available? Yes, guys. So in that situation, okay, our cloud needs to be up and running. Okay, it needs to uh, cloud uh, your, your application. It is cloud's responsibility to make it highly available without any latency. So that's what cloud brings you with it. So in Azure, there is a term called as SLA. So what is SLA? SLA is like a deal that you sign with your cloud service provider. It's like a service level agreement that you sign. Okay, it's like a deal or an agreement, okay, that you sign right before you purchase any uh, new apartment or any uh, big uh, business idea or anything that you are doing. Okay, you do an agreement with a partner or with a firm or anything like that, right? So you, you need to have an agreement or a deal. So Azure also has something called a service level agreement that it signs with you, okay, stating, okay, if you want this much availability, let's say it is in terms of nines, okay, 99. Let's say it is a visible, like you want your application, okay, to be. Uh, available to me nine. Okay, your application has to be, let's say, available to you. So let's say you want the availability to be around nine. It is in terms of 99 point and then what how much ever nines follows. Okay, so if you sign an agreement with Azure, okay, let's say you want 99.9% availability. Okay, so you can expect some amount of downtime. Okay, so if Azure fails to give you that 99.9% .9 availability, okay, you get some points or you get some credit, okay, into your subscription or you get those points back. Okay, you can redeem those back. You get it in terms of a credit. So that is why, uh, that's why uh, high availability becomes very important okay people don't like to be waited they need to be your application if you want it to be up and running you need to have that much availability with you okay so availability of course you need to have good internet connectivity otherwise you you cannot uh, claim those points as you all can say okay i provided the service but you didn't have good internet connectivity okay then that SLA is, um, you are not breaching the SLA then, okay? But if it's a, um, something from the cloud side, okay? And you're not getting that av high availability as promised, then you can uh, ask for those credits back, okay? So that is what cloud brings. It brings high availability of your application of any service that you are running, okay, on the cloud. then. Scalability, if you want to scale your applications up, down, okay, uh, you can do that, okay. Uh, you can configure scalability, okay, uh, how much memory you want, how much size of the resource it should be, you can decide, okay. Uh, it is up to you. Keep in mind, scalability is something that you configure, but elasticity is something that is done uh, dynamically. Okay, so it is done at the cloud side 
okay rather than you doing it but scalability is something that you can configure you can decide if you want to auto scale it or not it's up to you so this is the third benefit that cloud brings then the fourth benefit is reliability okay you can rely on it uh, it is like I said, high availability. It gets a SLA in picture. Okay, so based on that, you get a reliability. Okay, there is a deal signed be between you and the cloud service provider. Okay, so it your services or or your resources that you have deployed will be available to you, bringing in that reliability with the customer. Then predictability. You can predict your cost, okay? How you want to uh, manage your cost. You can predict your cost using two different services that I will be talking about. That is the cost, uh, the pricing calculator, and the total cost of ownership. Okay, so you can go online before you deploy any service or create any service. You can predict how much it will cost you from your subscription. You can get cost alerts. In case you are running out of subscription, you can even create a budget. Okay, let's say you have a budget of X amount. Okay, you can uh, tell Azure and Azure will tell you, okay, in this X amount of budget, what kind of services, what kind of resources you can deploy. Then the, uh, then the next benefit of cloud is security. This is the most amazing feature. You can, pre you can, Enable certain security services, okay, on Azure, which will help you make your service or resources highly, uh, uh, can protect your resources or services, okay, from threats, from attacks, okay, well within or well, yeah, well within time, okay, you can, uh, Azure will give you recommendations, will give you uh, suggestions as to how you can make your service uh, secure, protect it from different threats. Okay, what if the threat has occurred? Okay, what can you do after that? Will also be can also be determined using the cloud as well. Then coming to governance, like I told you, Azure has around sixty plus regions across. Uh, it depends, okay, uh, what kind of a service you are using, okay, uh, at what level are you using. So when we come to security, I will tell you all, okay, where and who is responsible for what, okay. And uh, of course, your SLA matters in terms of security as well, okay. So the higher the SLA, which means you are ready to pay a lot, okay, if you pay a lot, of course, you're going to get good amount of services, correct? The higher you pay, the better the services you will get. Of okay, and what kind of subscription you have, whether it's enterprise level, it's a free subscription, all of those things also matter when you are looking in terms of security. Then comes governance. So governance is, um, like I said, the there are certain data protection standards there are there are some industry standards there are uh, standards pertaining to every region across the globe okay like i said it's not just restricted to one country us or india it is spread across europe it is spread across uh, southeast asian countries right so they all have their own data protection standards correct so that's what Azure or the cloud service provider takes care of. You don't have to worry about it. It will take care of that. And that is why it is a benefit. Okay. But if you if your organization has some restrictions, okay, you can uh, enable that as well. So that feature is also available on your cloud. Then coming to the last benefit, that is manageability. OK, how can you manage your services, resources, monitor your services? OK, uh, see the health of that service. OK, if pertaining to a resource, let's say virtual machine database. OK, you want Azure to give you recommendations. You can do that and then manage those services. OK, so that's what manageability it brings. OK, but not just that you can access your cloud or your Azure using different uh, channels. 
Okay, we I'll explore and I will talk about this in uh, the last module. Okay, so this is what is what are the benefits of using cloud. Now coming to the capex and the opex um, comparison. So in the beginning, if you all recall, I had talked about uh, procuring infrastructure, buying infrastructure, uh, investing heavily in the uh, maintenance and uh, um, buying the infrastructure. So that cost that you incur, okay, is called as the capital expenditure. Okay, so the upfront cost or the initial cost that you spend, okay, on uh, procuring infrastructure, uh, um, creating a maintenance team to maintain your servers, maintain your um, applications and all of that is nothing but the capex. Okay, though capex decreases over time, goes down over time, okay, uh, you can... Um, it doesn't go completely, okay, because you're still uh, paying the maintenance team that is uh, maintaining your servers and etc. Okay, so you need to still pay them. You need to still pay for the electricity, correct? So that's what is uh, still there, but it does not go, okay? But now, sorry, uh, electricity it comes into the OPEX model. Sorry for that, okay? But uh, if you... Um, like I said, maintenance of the servers of the infrastructure is a part of the capex. Then comes the opex. Okay, so if I if you all recall, I gave you the example of electricity, uh, switching on your lights, switching off your lights. Okay, uh, that is what is the operational cost. So how long are you keeping your services running? Okay, the operation time is what is basically the uh, opex cost. OK, so if you are using the electricity, your light is on, you will be billed for that period. If you have turned off the light, switched off the light, you will not be billed for that particular appliance. OK, so that is what is the operational cost. So it is this cost does not go away. You're still paying for the electricity or for uh, yeah, for the electricity, the services, your how long you're using the services is what is the OPEX cost. OK, so cloud or Azure basically uses a model called as a consumption based model. OK, um, since I told you um, this is pertaining to the uh, to the uh, cost that you will incur if you want to create something called as a private cloud. I will tell you all what is a private cloud. Okay. Okay, so this is what you will, uh, if you want to set up your own cloud, okay, this is the cost or some, or um, yeah, this is the cost that you will incur, okay? But if you are using a cloud, so you're using, let's say, Azure or AWS, they go for something called as a consumption-based model. So as consumption, meaning how much you use, okay? How much you, uh, uh, for how long you use the resource, you will be billed for that, okay? This is almost similar to the OPEX of, yes. So, uh, you don't have to, you know, pay for the uh, initial, you don't have to worry about the capex, okay? But you have to pay for the resources that you use, how long you use those resources for that time, okay? You will be paid. So it's like your electricity bill that you get, okay, on monthly basis, correct? So it's the same thing. You do not have to purchase any uh, infrastructure. You do not have to... Uh, in, you don't you don't need any capex okay you should just be able to pay how much ever you use okay and the moment you stop using the resources you will not be billed for that okay so this is what is the model that is used by the cloud service providers nowadays okay then now coming to the different types of uh, or different models that cloud has, okay? So there are three uh, cloud models, okay? And 
since the beginning, I asked you all, right? Can you all tell me the cloud service providers and you're listed AWS, uh, Azure, GCP, IBM, correct? So those clouds are nothing but the public cloud. The cloud that is available to the public where the public does not have to worry about the infrastructure, does not have to worry about the maintenance of the infrastructure or running of the infrastructure. That is what is the public cloud. All you have to do is use the resources of that cloud of that person. OK, and you can. Uh, just and just pay for whatever you have used. OK, and start run or uh, create your services deploy your applications and so on and so forth okay so that is what is the public cloud okay you do not have to uh, uh, create anything you just have to use the cloud service providers resources okay and just pay for whatever you're using and apart from that like i told you all cloud needs a good internet connectivity so that's what you will need OK, then the second is the private cloud. So if you all recall, I told you all buying your own uh, uh, services, buying your own in uh, sorry, buying your own infrastructure, maintaining that infrastructure is nothing but a private cloud. OK, so a private cloud is something that is owned by an organization or organization like uh, Microsoft, let's say, OK, though they have Azure as a cloud for their for pub public. So let's say for their employees, they have another cloud running, but it is restricted only for the people working in Microsoft. OK, so it is something that is not available outside the organization. OK, it is just available to people within the organization. So whichever organization you work. Let's say they have their own uh, cloud and that cloud is called as the private cloud. So a cloud based. So what I mean by cloud or where these servers and all are there, uh, it is the, it is maintained in a building. OK, it's like a building that is maintained. Lots of buildings are there. OK, uh, like that, but a building where or where you find these servers, OK. Is called as a data center. No, it's not different from on premise. Uh, keep in mind, guys, private cloud is the same as on premise. They both are the same. It's just two different terms have been given. OK, they are both the same. Yes, it's just not available to the public. OK, so this is what is the private cloud. OK, and if you when if uh, you have to deploy or you know where the servers are kept is basically called the data center. So data center is like a big building where your servers are kept. OK, and uh, where the servers are kept uh, like, like a building has floors, right? So similarly, a data center has something called as racks. OK, it has something called as racks where lots and lots of servers are kept. OK, so this is uh, what is the private cloud. Then if you want the benefit of both, OK, let's say you have some servers uh, running or you have some applications running on the private cloud and your private cloud is full. It cannot accommodate much uh, services, but you want to scale your uh, services. OK, so what you can do is you can deploy some of those same services onto the public cloud so you can combine the combine both these cloud okay and that is called as the hybrid cloud okay so for example just for example let's say there is a wedding at your house okay and you have lots and lots of relatives coming in okay so what you uh, and you have to you know uh, make uh, or you have to uh, 
provide some resource where you can house them, keep them. Okay, so let's say you keep some people at home at your own house. Okay, so that is kind of like a private club, but some you manage or you do booking in a hotel, right? So that becomes like a public or uh, so something like that you can do. So at home you're managing. So on private cloud, you have some services and on some services you have given it to some third party which are managing their end. Okay, so this is what is the hybrid cloud. OK, so if you want the benefit of both, you want best of both worlds, then you go for a hybrid cloud. But hybrid cloud requires a license. You need to have the appropriate license in order to use the hybrid cloud on Azure. OK, I will, talk, I will tell you all about that in the last module. So this is a comparison. OK, like I said, public cloud, you don't need to give, you don't need to invest anything. You do not require capital. You do not require a team. You can quickly provision, deprovision, roll out, or get in more resources for your application depending on your need. Okay. And you pay only for what, or yeah, you pay only for the time and what kind of resource you have used. Whereas in private cloud, it's it's the same as on premise. You are creating your own cloud. So of course you need to buy infrastructure, maintain that infrastructure, security, and all maintenance of those resources is your responsibility. Okay, whereas in public cloud, you don't need to do that. And hybrid cloud, best of both worlds, manage some resources on private cloud, manage some resources on public cloud, and that is what is hybrid cloud. Okay, so like I said, your organization, has some resources, okay, let's say databases deployed on private cloud, on servers in your organization, okay, let's say. But now you cannot afford to buy more resources, more infrastructure in your private cloud. So what you do, but you need more databases. So what do you do? You take or you tell, or you take one of the uh, cloud service providers, OK, let's say AWS or Azure. OK, and you deploy some of those databases on the public cloud. So what you're doing, you're not buying more infrastructure. You're not buying any uh, uh, space to manage or a team. You're not expanding that maintenance team to manage your server servers. OK, so let's say you can't afford to buy the uh, infrastructure at the private cloud, but you can afford to buy the subscription to a uh, uh, public cloud and you deploy some of those services over there. So like databases, okay, your organization team is expanding or something like that. Okay, you want to uh, manage uh, the databases, expand your databases so you can go for a hybrid cloud. Okay, but security for private becomes different, public becomes different, cost and all become different. So those that manageability or managing that is a challenge. So it's something that you need to have or organizations need to have a good control on. OK. So this is the different types of cloud models. We have the public, the private cloud and the hybrid cloud. Now let's talk about the. Services of cloud. OK, so let's do one thing. Uh, let's take a break now. OK, let's take a 20 minute break. OK, uh, we'll just do a quick refresh. I mean, just uh, rela relax for like 20 minutes, stretch your legs and then come back. OK, and we will start on what are the different services in cloud.
Hi guys, Chaitali here. Uh, guys, I have shared the, uh, the badge, the learning achievement badge for AZ900 certification. So basically this badge includes the modules, the overview of the module and the learning, learning path and the journey path inside the badge. So you just have to follow certain steps to get your badge activated. So as you can see on the screen, I have shared the steps. First, you have to go on the Microsoft Learn platform. You just have to click on the link and get your profile created if you don't have your profile on Microsoft Learn. Once you create your profile, you just have to click on the link which has been shared with you all in the chat box with the steps. And you will get a pop up to get the badge activated, you will get a redeem button. You just have to click on that button and you will get the badge activated. The badge will reflect on your profile in some time. Here you can see under module courses and more, you can see your badge. Here you can see Completion on 8-4-2023. That means I have activated my AZ-900 batch. So you just have to follow that step and get your batch activated. Also, if you're facing any problem, please do let me know in the chat box. I'm there to help you out. Guys, I have shared the steps in the chat box. Also, the URL has been mentioned with it. If you're facing any problem while the redemption of the badge, do let me know.
pradeep i will recommend to get your batch activated to your uh, personal id so uh, the batch will stay with you it's fine if you can if you use your organization email id there's no issue with that Okay, so Emma is unable to sign in. Uh, Emma, uh, you you can use your organization uh, email ID.
uh, guys, you just have to go on Microsoft Learn as you can see on the screen. The link has been shared with the steps itself. So you just have to click on that link. Go on Microsoft Learn. You have to create your profile first if you don't have profile created on Microsoft Learn platform. So make sure you go and sign in. You create your profile first. And click on the URL. Which has been shared uh, after the fourth step. You can see a, a URL. You just have to click on that. You will get a redeem button over there. You just have to click on that button and get your batch activated. So batch will look like this. You just have to go on your profile again. And in your profile under achievement, module and courses, you will get your badge. You just have to go on achievements. There you can see module and courses. Under that, you will get your badge. Yes, guys, I all back. Please put it in the chat box if you all are back. Yes, raise your hand, something like that.
Okay, great. So I can see a lot of people are back. I'll just share my screen again. Okay, so before the break, we were talking about we did uh, the scenario before cloud. We understood the uh, what is cloud. We understood um, the benefits of cloud. Okay, and what is Microsoft is your uh, uh, why is it so popular and so and so forth. Correct. And then before the break, we stopped at what were the different types of cloud models. Okay. So now let's talk about the different services that cloud offers. Okay. So when you use um, cloud, okay. Uh, let's say you are using Azure and Azure is a public model. Correct. But now on Azure, Okay, let's say you want, there are hundreds of services. I told you, right? Around 3,400 services are available on Azure. Okay, so if you have to use those services, those services are of different types. Okay, and um, those types we will be studying right now. So the very first type of service that Azure offers, okay, is called as the infrastructure as a service. OK, so let's say you want to for an application. OK, you want to configure the infrastructure. OK, like you want to decide which operating system you want, what size of virtual ma ma uh, machine do you want? What what should be the memory size? OK, uh, what kind of application you want to install? OK or what kind of data you want to install. OK, all these configurations, if you want to manage, OK, that kind of a service is called as infrastructure as a service. So this is the most flexible service that is available on Azure. OK, uh, wherein the infrastructure flexibility is offered, OK, compared to uh, the physical infrastructure like the storage on the uh, data center, the networking, but on the data center or um, uh, server management or all of that, but that is restricted to the physical server or at the cloud service side. But on when you run an application, okay, you need an environment that is created, correct, on top of which your applications will run. So what kind of a... Uh, um, uh, operating system do you want? Do you want it Windows based? Do you want it Linux based? What should be the size of the disk that you are using? OK, when we use our laptops, correct? So we, um, uh, we you know, when we go and select a um, laptop, we ask no, the user, like I mean, the uh, seller, OK? What is the uh, hard disk? How much is the hard disk? How much is the RAM? And so on and so forth, right? These are our questions. So when you are creating an application, OK, or deploying an application, so are your questions, right? OK, how much will I require? What virtual machine will I require? What size of virtual machine I will require? OK, what kind of a data I'm going to use it for? So depending on that, I need to configure that infrastructure. So if you want that flexibility, and that flexibility is brought by infrastructure as a service. So here, you don't decide what kind of a, uh, uh, you don't decide just, uh, you don't decide the physical aspect, but on top of that, the other physical aspects, if you want to configure, you go for infrastructure as a service. And the classic example of infrastructure as a service is the virtual machine or the VM. Have you all used uh, Oracle uh, Virtual Box? Yes, guys, have you all used Oracle Virtual Box? So, Okay, I just see one person. What about the rest? Okay. 
Okay. So earlier, uh, when uh, people didn't have access to cloud that much, okay, uh, like um, if people wanted to, you know, let's say uh, I, uh, when I was in college, like I, I was working on, um, uh, on a software called as Xilinx. Okay, it's, it was related to um, uh, writing code in FPGA and all. So I'm, I'm from the electronics background. So that is why I'm relating to it. Okay, so when I have to work with Xilinx, Xilinx requires a Windows operating system. Okay, which is less than eight. Okay, the operating system version of Windows should be less than eight, like seven or XP, some kind, some Windows or uh, operating system of that background. Okay, and of course, um, I uh, when I was in college, the latest Windows was ten. Okay, so. Of, and if I now, like I told you, I have to work on uh, Xilinx, which requires a uh, Windows operating system, which is much of it's of a lower version, right? So if I have to use a operating system for Xilinx, which is lower than that, I can't install that software on my actual machine, right? I couldn't do that. So uh, that time I didn't have I didn't have the access to cloud. So we would use something called as virtual box. Okay, it is a software. Sorry. So it is a it, there was a virtual box which was launched by Oracle, okay, uh, where I had to install the box, okay, onto my system, okay, and when I used to install the box, I had to dedicate a space to it. I had to configure some space from my machine, okay, RAM and. Uh, for which how much cores I need to dedicate, all of that I had to configure and then I could install the box. Okay, once I've installed the box after the basic configuration of my RAM, okay, then I would need to install a image of the Windows operating system 7, let's say. So this is what was the challenge earlier. Okay, when cloud was not there, we had to use install a virtual box on my own system, configure the RAM. Okay, how much space I would need to give to the virtual box. Okay, and then after that, download a separate image of my win of the operating system I want, and then I will go into that environment and then I will install my software, required software. But now, since cloud has come in, okay, it has made it much more easier to deploy, you know, to deploy a virtual machine or create a virtual machine. And how is that doing? It is doing through this infrastructure as a service. Since I can configure, okay, instead of my local, instead of my machine, okay, my laptop, I can just online go. Okay, how much size of disk I want, how, which operating system image I want. Do you have a custom image? A everything I can configure instead of worrying about, okay, I am utilizing this much space from my machine. My machine, my other applications are running slow. Okay, so none of those challenges I need to face. Okay, I can now, okay, just using a good internet connectivity, I can work with the virtual machine. So this is what this is another benefit of using cloud. OK, so instead of you configuring or creating a virtual machine onto your own machine, OK, you can just go online and, you know, like how you upload images on a Google Drive or something so that your memory uh, space on your mobile is not consumed. It's put on a virtualized environment. It's the same thing with VMs. So if I have to create a VM, so what kind of a service is that? It is a infrastructure as a service. Then there is another service called as 
platform as a service. So in platform as a service, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry what kind of an operating system I will need, what kind of an environment I will need, what size of disk I will need. I don't have to worry about the physical infrastructure at the cloud side. OK, all I have to focus is on deploying the application. OK, let's say I want a database. I want um, a storage. Of what kind of an application you want? OK, those basic configurations you do. OK, and you just focus on that. Focus on the data you are going to work with and forget about the. Uh, underlying infrastructure that is there. OK, so you don't have to worry about anything in the back end. You just have to configure the. Um, just configure that application like what? Um, um, where do you want to deploy that application in what region you want to deploy? OK, uh, what should be the redundancy? All these things you decide. So those are the basic configurations that you do rest. What operating system the application is using? What size of the disk is using? You don't have to worry. So that kind of a service is called as platform as a service on any cloud you go. OK, this is the service that is provided. Then we have the software as a service. So the classic example is the Microsoft 365. Are you all aware of Microsoft 365 guys? Do you all know what it is? I'm pretty sure many of you all use Office apps like uh, Windows app, uh, the Microsoft PowerPoint app, Excel. Right? Every day people use th these applications. Currently now I'm using one of its applications, correct? So when you uh, are using these applications, do you have to worry about what operating system is there in the background? How much space it is using? What disk, how much disk is it, it is using? I need to dedicate it this much space. I need to dedicate that much space. And are you worrying about that? Are you worrying about the configuration of the application? Yes, guys. No, no, I, what you do is just install the application. If you have the appropriate key, license key, product key, right? You just have to, you, in, you just need that key, okay? And you can install the application onto your laptop. You don't even have to install them. You can just use it online as well, right? You, what you need, you just need a Office 365 subscription, correct? So you don't have to worry about anything. That is in the background. Not even worry about the applications. You have ready made applications for you. You just have to use those applications, just have the appropriate subscription, and you can start writing your or do anything with the data. You have to, all you have to do is manage the data. So, in a word file, what data you're going to put, it's not going to be determined by the cloud service provider, right? It is you who has to configure it, right? What presentations are you going to make? It is something that you are going to decide. You just are going to use the application. Okay, so this is what is software as a service. So, uh, Office 365 emails that you use with, uh, I think with Google also, they have their own drive, they have their own docs, they have their own presentation uh, applications, right? You just have to buy them. Okay, so this is what is software as a service. So with these services, this is just a comparison. You have a responsibility that you share. Correct. So, like I said, when you're using infrastructure as a service, okay, you are responsible for the back end operations for the infrastructure, as the name says. Just you don't have to worry about the physical infrastructure, that is the storage at the cloud side, the networking at the cloud side, right? Data center management at the cloud side. You don't have to worry about that. What you have to worry is the Operating system, the virtual disk size, correct? Or what kind of applications do you need? Okay, who should have the access to that particular service? Who should not have? Okay, whether you want a desktop app or a mobile app, okay, 
all these things you decide. Rest is done by the cloud service provider. If you don't want further, uh, uh, you don't want to worry more about the infrastructure, then you go for platform as a service. So in platform as a service, what do you do? You just worry about the application. Security is also up to you. OK, you need to uh, worry about the security. OK, um, it, uh, it is up to you. OK, your data and all. I will, like I said, I will talk about it later when we come to that aspect. OK, what kind of which security is in your hand, which is not in your hand. OK, it is determined by you. OK, you can configure it. OK, so coming to yeah, coming to platform as a service. OK, you your responsibility is configuring the application. OK, uh, for um, configuring like I said, security, I will discuss later, guys. Um, it is something that we will uh, see much later. I will talk about it later. OK, so please do not pester me with those questions as of now. Keep it on hold. OK, so coming to the platform as a service here, you are not worried about the back end. You just focus on configuring the application and the data that you are going to put into that application whereas in uh, uh, software as a service okay uh, you do not have to worry anything about the back end or configuring the application all you have to do is just install it and start using it or if you don't want to install it you can use it online as well okay it is all up to you it is all in your hand so i you know this security this shared responsibility model that is there is what i feel is better explained if i explain to you something called as pizza as a service this is a concept that i really really like okay it's not just pizza you can think of any food i'm pretty sure don't worry you're going to get a lunch break soon okay it's something that i like to configure or call it as pizza as a service so let's consider one scenario at a time okay uh let's say i have an on-premise cloud OK, so if I have to talk about the con like if I have to talk about the responsibility, who has what responsibility? So if I am making a pizza, OK, so uh, the dough making process of the pizza, getting the ingredients for the pizza, setting up the table. OK, what beverages do I want? What whether it should? OK, uh, where do I cook the pizza? whether it should be cooked in the oven, in a furnace, at what temperature, okay, is what I am going to decide, is what I am going to make. Right? It is not something, it is not something to Okay, it is something that I will configure. It is something that I will do from scratch. Correct? So that kind of a thing or that kind of a pizza or service is called as on-premise where you manage everything, okay? Even the security, firmware updates, what applications you want, what I, who should get access and who should not get access is all determined by you. Then if let's say, have you heard of those DIY kits, do it yourself kits, right? I think during the lockdown, it was very common, do it yourself and we'll just provide some basic, uh, uh, material to you and you can just do everything on yourself then okay so let's say i give you the pizza dough i give you the tomato sauce okay i give you the toppings and all of that for the pizza okay rest how to cook this uh, pizza what size of the pizza uh, what what should be the size of the pizza you cook it in oven you cook it on gas you cook it well the elect the electricity to cook the pizza in the oven in the furnace or whatever the fire wood whatever you need you bring okay or uh, what is do you want side where you want to sit and eat okay it's what you decide okay uh, rest i will provide to you that kind of a service is called as infrastructure as a service what I am giving you, I'm giving you the physical requirements. Rest all what you are doing, you are doing it on your own. You are configuring. I'm giving you the full flexibility. So if what size of pizza you want to make out of the dough I give you, 
it's up to you okay at uh, when you want to make it you decide okay what kind of beverages you want you decide a lot that uh, that you want to have along with the pizza whether you want to sit outside and eat you want to uh, sit sit uh, on the dining table and eat you decide so this is what is called as infrastructure as a service and then in platform as a service let's say you just order pizza from outside okay let's say you order pizza from domino's pizza hut whichever com whichever uh, pizza company you like you order so what are you doing over there are you worrying about uh, the uh, infrastructure do you need the toppings do you need the pizza dough do you need the oven do you need the gas do you need uh, the tomatoes for the sauce or uh, no you're not doing anything what you're doing you're just configuring what pizza you want what size of the pizza you want what toppings do you want right you are and the beverages that that you want to have with the pizza and where you're going to eat so these are the things that you are worried about rest you are just configuring the pizza or configuring your application correct so that is called as platform as a service so it's like imagine you your the pizza is getting delivered for you at home depending on your requirement so that is called as platform as a service and then coming to uh, software as a service let's say you eat the pizza outside to a restaurant you go to domino's you go to pizza hut and you eat okay so that is called as software as a service all you do you just pay for the services or you just go and take their services right the waiter will come he will ask you what pizza you want what size of the pizza you want and all in rest you all know so you all have eaten outside i'm pretty sure okay so that is what is called as software as a service where you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure about the applications you just have to get the example uh, you just have to uh, place the order for your pizza okay So dining table and soda is the uh, applications, okay, that you configure. Like, um, uh, for example, you have an app service, okay, and on top of that, uh, you want to run, let's say, Python or something. What application you want to run, okay? Uh, like I gave you the example of my uh, this thing. I wanted to use a software like Xilinx or an application like Xilinx, okay. So whichever environment you want you don't decide stylings will come packaged with that probably and on that stylings what code i'm going to write becomes my data okay so that's what basically is platform as a service so you configure the application okay you can and what data you want to put into that application you configure okay i am going to sit and just deploy the application use that application okay that's what is platform as a service. So guys, any questions up till now? You can put it in the chat box. You can let me know. Okay. Am I good to go ahead? Just let me know, guys. Yes, guys, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. Let me know. Are you all comfortable? Come on, guys, I expect some response. Come on. Okay, so I, I, I'll just explain this concept to you. Okay, you can just refer to this diagram if you want to. Okay, so I just gave relating this responsibility model. Okay, I'm, I was comparing it to the uh, pizza. Like if you order a pizza in three different ways or the, you know, four different ways or you make a pizza, how, 
where what is you know uh, where what lies is what I have basically told. OK, so see pass guys. Um, OK, when I. I'll do one thing once we get into module two, I will show you. Uh, is my screen not visible? Uh, Chaitali, can you just confirm once? Uh, or anyone else, can you just put it in the chat box? You can't see my screen. OK, so I'll just explain this to you all. OK. So when we talk about responsibility, OK, so there are when you use, let's say I gave you the example of uh, VM, right? So earlier I you I had to get install the VM. Yeah, you are responsible for the data. You are responsible. In SAS, OK, so. Uh, yeah, so. The in infrastructure as a service, OK, though the physical or uh, at the data center, whatever uh, space you require on the server side or on the uh, data center is taken care by the cloud service provider, OK, but. Let's say for an application. OK, you need a f you need full flexibility. OK, right from the operating system. OK, to uh, what size of the disk you want. OK, or for that matter, uh, what applications you want to install. Let's say now when you buy Office 365, you get all the applications there, right? But on what environment it is there, OK? Um, like for example, um, OK, I'll do one thing. I will once we get into module two, I will explain what is what. OK, it will be more clear uh, what is pass, what is IAS. Once we start uh, demonstrating, does that work for you? So you will understand the bet. You will get a bet clear picture over there. OK, so once we demonstrate things, I think it will be better. OK, I'll explain that concept over there. OK, so now uh, like I told you, OK. Um, as you all uh, like there are people like, you know, uh, servers where your application, your services that you deploy on a cloud needs to be, you know, uh, needs to be present somewhere. Right, it needs to be uh, available somewhere uh, near to you, correct? Um, and um, you need a re you need a place where you can deploy those services, right? So that's what regions bring you with. If I say I want to deploy an application, okay, you need to determine in which region you want to deploy that application. For example, uh, just one minute. So let's say I have an application, OK, and. I sit in London, OK, and I have a application created there which I want to deploy, OK. Uh, so what I will do, I will I let's say I have Azure subscription and Azure has a data center, OK, in the London region. OK, let's say I am in London. OK, so there will be a data center. And I've already told you a data center is like a big building with full of servers. OK, and they are distributed in terms of racks. 
okay so if i so let's say i have an application deployed this is my application okay so now what will happen so in let's say i am i'm in london and i have deployed an application okay inside the london region of azure okay on the data center of azure okay so what does this mean okay like people who are in london they can easily access this application okay so any user from uh, london wants to use my app they can do that okay they will get high availability and so and so forth okay but now let's say there are people who are sitting in mumbai okay let's say there are people sitting in mumbai and they are trying to access my app so what are the what is the challenge that people in mumbai will face in or when they are using this application so what will be the challenge that they will face don't you think there will be delay in order when they get this when they are trying to uh, access this application yes correct or latency is what they will expect so if i want to reduce that latency so what i will do i will let's say on a data center i will i will deploy the same application or yeah so on some other data center i have i have you know uh, deployed my application but what if this entire region goes down what if this data center for example not region this data center goes down then what will happen do you think people in mumbai will still face latency don't you think they will still face latency delay in receiving their application i have deployed it on some other data center in london don't you think it should be you know still be available even if this data center has gone down it should be right can people in london still access this can people in london still access this app, app without any delay can people still access this yes they can still access this app in london but what about the people in mumbai what about them they are still facing latency even if this data center goes down then what then can people in london also access this app no right so if i have to deploy my application okay i need to put it in regions that are closer okay to the people using my application okay so if i have to deploy these if i am sitting in london and i am making this app available to only london people then it is fine but if people in are using this application from mumbai then i have to create another region okay deploy my app on another region in mumbai so for that i need to have my cloud right i need to have cloud available in that region correct so that's what azure gets you or brings to you it tell it helps you with the, because of this presence across the globe okay 
you can deploy your applications as easily as possible. I mean, you can deploy them very easily because of its presence across the globe. OK, so where these data centers are present. OK, so those are nothing but something called as regions. So people from Mumbai, if they want to access, you can deploy an application in Mumbai as well as in London. OK, so this is what, what is called as region. So regions are nothing but actual physical geography. OK, actual locations on the on Earth. OK, so where you can find your data centers. OK, so this is how a data center looks like. This is an actual data center or region. OK, this is Dublin uh, region that I'm talking about, Ireland region where a data center is present or this is one of the regions okay in uh, where you can deploy your application so here you can see there are networking towers lots of servers racks or servers are there you can see then there are cooling units on the side okay over here in order to keep the servers cool okay so this is how a data centers they can be underwater also I think Azure Microsoft has some data centers below the ground. OK, they can be underwater or on terrace, ter uh, this thing. Yeah, so they can be anywhere. OK, as long as they are able to provide all these resources, they can be available anywhere. So this is what is a region. So a region brings, reduces that latency. OK, so that people from across the globe can try and use your application. OK, so how do you think Instagram or WhatsApp or all these applications are available to you? Right, they might have their own servers deployed, their application deployed on those servers closer to your region. So probably for South or for Asia, they have a service center close uh, available uh, in a region closer to you. So that is why you are facing little latency and because of that you have high availability uh, offered to you, right? So this is what is a region. And if you have to create any service or resource on Azure, you need a region, okay? You need to have a region, okay? So a region is nothing but like I told you, actual geography or actual place present location on earth and azure has around 60 plus regions i already told you all in the beginning okay and it has around one it is spread across 140 countries okay so with regions there is something if like i told you your application needs to be highly available so how does azure provide that high availability that is done through these availability zones OK, so what are availability zones? Availability zones are nothing but your data centers. OK, they are, let's say uh, there is a region. OK, this is your region. So within the region, you will have three availability zones. So let's say uh, this is a region. And like I said, there are three availability zones. So each availability zone will have one or two data centers within them. OK, one availability zone can have one data center. Other availability zone can have two data centers. The third availability zone can have one data center. It depends on how Azure has distributed it. OK. So this is what is basically inside a region, OK? And these availability zones are connected through low latency optical fibers, OK? Because they shouldn't be responsible when you are deploying any service or anything. They shouldn't be responsible to um, No, they will not ask you how many regions are there, but you should know about the regions. You don't have to remember these regions at all. OK, but concept of availability zones and this is very important. OK, how can you make your service highly available? 
okay how what are the um, um, challenges that one can face so i will gradually tell you all about how and what are the challenges uh, that are there okay when uh, that you will face so like i told you a data center can go down right the electricity can go down probably there is some natural calamity or uh, uh, there is network is not being received. OK, so uh, what are those challenges? I'll tell you all when, once we get into module two. OK, so there is lots of things involved uh, in terms of availability zone as well. So it's just an introduction that I'm doing over here. OK, so every region will have three availability zones, not more than that. OK, it is going to be only three availability zones. OK. Um, is my screen not visible, guys? Can you all see the three availability zones that I'm talking about? Or can you see uh, uh, some map, uh, the Ireland region that I'm talking about? OK, so uh, if you can't see my screen uh, about the map, uh, I mean, just uh, log in and uh, rejoin the meeting again. OK, three availability zones is a mandatory. It is something that Azure has decided. OK, it's not something that is in my hand or in your hand. OK, it is decided by Azure. OK, so uh, for example, let's. Um, OK. It is something that Azure has decided or any. It depends on the uh, uh, cloud service provider. OK. OK, so a region is divided into three availability zones and they are connected through low latency uh, optic fibers because when you deploy your service, it's actually not deployed on a region. It is deployed on one of these availability zones that are there. OK, so you don't know which availability zone you don't have that much. If you go for a pass service, you don't have that uh, uh, option, but if you go for uh, uh, infrastructure as a service, I will show you you have that uh, flexibility into which availability zone you can put your service. OK, so if you go for a pass service that is not available, but in terms of a, a VM, when I when we create one, I will definitely show you where you can uh, change that setting. OK, so when a re when you select a region, OK, Yes, it has only three availability zones. It can't have more than that. OK, and each availability zone can have one or two or three data centers, depending on what Azure has decided. OK, uh, but just remember uh, that also we don't know. It depends on the availability zone. It is up to Azure OK, to decide how many data centers to put in availability zone one, how many data centers to put in availability zone two. OK, so when we deploy an application or create a service, it is actually created on the availability zone. OK, these are the ones which are responsible to keep your service available. OK, so it can be deployed on availability zone one, two, three. OK, it does not. We don't know where it is done. OK, and apart from that, each data center has is equipped with its own infrastructure, power pooling. So here in this image that you saw, this is one data center, one availability zone in the Dublin Ireland region. OK, uh, it can uh, within that only uh, it can have. So you can see it, there will be one more availability zone in a closer uh, region, which will be connected to uh, this availability zone. OK, so this is how it is divided. Each region was divided into three availability zones. So it can it has its own cooling, networking. OK, 
uh, and of course they help you in getting high availability. So this is what this is how a region is divided. Okay, so if you have to when you deploy any application, this is how it is deployed. So let's say one region of yours is, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say probably the London region goes down. OK, completely uh, for some reason, some flood has come for, for due to some natural calamity or for that matter, some technical error. OK, at the data center level or so and so forth. OK, so at that time, OK, uh, Azure has a re region pair allocated to the London region or any other on, on any Azure region that you select. OK, so why, where do these Azure regions help you? So let's say you your that your primary region. OK, let's say the Lund uh, Europe region has gone down. OK, uh, and you want your application to still be available, right? I told you you have an SLA with the uh, Microsoft service with Microsoft Azure. You have an SLA, so Microsoft has to keep its word, correct? So how will it do it? has created a region pair for every primary region that you select. So any primary region, let's say you select the East US region. If East US goes down, OK, it has a backup region, the secondary region that is the West US, where all your services will be, you know, kind of uh, transferred or deployed over there with little bit of downtime. OK, there will be, of course, downtime. But uh, it will be something that is automatic. OK, it will happen at the uh, data center or at the region level. It's something that you will not know. OK, uh, but of course, there are other factors to it. If you pay more and uh, you have a good SLA with that, so you will expect little downtime and so and so forth. Those factors do come into picture. But keep in mind. If you have selected one region, there will be another region allocated to it and that is called as a region pair. So these region pairs are separated with a distance of 300 miles. OK, they have a distance of 300 miles between them. OK, again, the uh, other region will have the same concept, three availability zones, and uh, they are all connected to the fiber optics and so and so forth. The same concept will be applied to the region pair. OK. So this is how your uh, this is how it looks like. OK, a region pair. OK, this is your availability zone one in region one. This is your available. So you can see the same concept is applied to. Uh, yeah, I told you data centers are in the zones itself. A data and uh, availability zone has data one, two, three, depending on how much is your ones. OK, data centers inside it. OK. Then um, now uh, certain regions, OK, uh, Azure has identified them as sovereign regions, OK, because they have their own set of policies, their own set of regulations, their own set of uh, standards, OK, uh, which Azure needs to, uh, you know, kind of uh, adhere to, has to follow. OK, so it has declared them to be uh, sovereign regions. So anything that falls under the US government services, regions that fall or federal agencies, local governments or all of that, if uh, as if you are working with the government services, so you are a part of the sovereign region. OK, you will have different authorization, different uh, as your instances. And region, OK, for your services to work. So let's say you are a part of the US federal agency. OK, so you will not be using those uh, regions that are available to the public. You will have separate regions, OK, physically separated from those public regions. OK, and where you will deploy your own service, OK, because you are a part of the US uh, government. OK, so uh, Azure has given it a name. Called as the Azure government. OK, it has given it. Yeah, but 
only azure the government uses the azure uh, if you are a part of the federal agency okay so they use azure okay if they have to use azure so azure has given it a separate name altogether called as the azure government then for china they have a separate service okay you all know china has some different weird rules they don't have whatsapp they don't have instagram they don't have youtube they have their own applications that are running okay uh, if you ever i don't know if you have ever visited china so but these all services don't work in uh, china okay they have their own set of cloud okay azure has its presence there it is present uh, through 21 via net okay uh, this is the service this is the provider that uh, gives uh, azure services okay it is given through this particular organization okay and this organization is responsible for managing the policies complying with the government okay uh, and adhering to their policies because china has some other policies as well even for germany they have another region okay um uh it's as your uh, germany i think okay so that is also one of the sovereign regions that azure has because they also have some other uh, compliance policies so for that also they have another region now coming to azure uh, yeah for eu i guess yeah so they have another uh, uh, sovereign region for that i've not mentioned it over here you can go online and you can uh, search for azure sovereign regions you'll get all the information then coming to azure resources what i've been talking about since the beginning okay uh, is nothing but the resources that you can deploy on azure okay you want to create virtual machines you want to uh, have a storage account for yourself okay um uh, that i'm not sure of okay it is actually only for us government okay uh, they yeah they have a they have a separate uh, 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 data center uh, dedicated to the us government okay uh, so yeah you can call it kind of like a private or a yeah private cloud you can okay so these are uh, yeah so coming to the resources so when i talked about resources services is nothing but this you want to create a virtual machine you want to create you want to create your own website you want to create functions applications your own databases those are termed as as your resources okay so this is what we will be seeing in module 2 okay how to create these services how to work around these services now the other thing in azure apart from regions that is important is called as the resource group so what is a resource group so resource group is like a logical container right so let's say you are working on a project okay so when you work on a project okay um, you make sure that whatever um uh, uh material related to that project right you put it into one folder right when i am work like i am giving you az900 training okay so what i do whatever material i have related to az900 i make sure i put it in one folder okay so if next time i get an az900 training okay i don't have to go and search in 10 different folders i i know okay there is one folder for az900 where i have everything listed out if i have to refer to any material presentations i will go to that folder so if you want the same thing okay with your application with your website okay uh, let's say your application requires a virtual machine requires a storage account requires a database okay it is it makes sense to put things in one place in a in one container right so this is what is a resource group so resource groups help you manage uh help you manage that uh, uh help you put all the resources that you need for a particular application into one resource into one container okay whether that let's say website requires 
this virtual machine of this size, you put it into one. It also requires a database where you can store your data. OK, uh, that is coming from the website. OK, and let's say you want to run a Python application. You can do that. OK, but you can put it into one group. OK, like you in. Um, uh, when you like you all come from an organization, right? So when lots of people sit at different desks. So uh, it's not like the marketing team. Some people sit on another desk or uh, the uh, sales team sit on another desk. No, right? They sit at one particular place, right? This is one section dedicated to the marketing team. This is one section dedicated to the sales team, correct? So that's it. That's the same thing with your resource group. So if you want a much or uh, um, uh, organized way you can go for a resource group okay you can have multiple resource group for different applications okay um billing is on the subscription so it's and the service that you are deploying it's not on the resource group that is applied okay so it's just for uh logic it's just to put things at one place that is the only thing the billing is done on the service that you deploy inside the resource group. So whether it's a virtual machine, it's a database, it's a storage account. It uh, that, the, as your resource group uh, determines the billing. Yes, it is on the subscription level just so that you can have organization of your application. For those purposes, you have a resource group. So you can have multiple resource groups. That is not a problem. You can have one resource group uh, which has one uh, uh, resource deployed. You can have another resource group where another resource is deployed. That is also possible. OK, uh, it's not compulsory. It is up to you how you want to manage your resources. OK. Yes, you can have different re a re a re a resource group. No, a resource group once you create is created at one region. OK, but if a re if you create a resource, let's say a virtual machine or a storage account that can be in some other region, it need not be in the same region as the resource group. That is totally possible. Yes, but a resource group once you create will be in one region. Virtual machine can be in some other region. Database can be in some other region. That is totally possible. That is fine. That works. Absolutely work. Then. If you have to use Azure, OK. Um, you can't share. You can share data, but you can't share the resource. You have to give access to the resource. So I will be talking about the access. OK, region wise. Uh, no, you have to give access to the resource group. You can't uh, um, share or something. You can't share. I mean, uh, you can give access or uh, allow people to use it. OK. So in a way, you are sharing the resource itself. <clears throat> yeah, so now coming to the uh, subscription, OK, like you uh, you need. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you all use uh, OT. You watch films or series on OTT platforms, right? Or YouTube also for that matter. So what do you do? You uh, for free, you can't like expect all of the things to come, right? Only some limited things will come. Like there are many uh, challenges to it. Like you will face ads every two minutes, three minutes or something like that. You will uh, not be uh, able to access all the movies or all the series, right? That are there available on that particular platform. So it's the same thing with subscription. OK, so in order to use Azure, you need a subscription like how you need a subscription to any OTT platform, right? So now why do you need a subscription? So a subscription is something that determines billing, how much you are allowed to uh, use what. OK, yeah, here also you have to pay. OK, uh, if you have to use Azure, you also have to pay in order to get the subscription. OK, so how much money is left in your um, subscription? What kind of an access do you have? OK, all that is determined using your Azure subscription. 
Okay. If without a subscription, you will not be able to use Azure. Okay. So your billing reports, your uh, um, invoices, what, for which service have you used? How much money has been used? Okay. For which service you have what access? Okay. Do you have some other subscription? Okay. Uh, it's all determined through this particular service of Azure. Okay. So this is what determines the authentication and the access of any Azure resource that you have to use. Now, if let's say uh, you uh, like you all come from an organization, right? And your organization is uh, working with Azure Cloud. OK, so what we will do for every department. OK, so, uh, they will have uh, for your organization. They will create something called as a management group. So this management group, OK, will have different subscriptions within it. OK, so for example, like uh, your organization has marketing department, sales department, HR department, right? And they all are using Azure Cloud. OK, so what your organization will do, they will buy different subscriptions for these. Departments for sales, for marketing, for HR, OK, and they will. Put them under one group and that group is called as a management group. So anyone from the sales department can use cloud using the sales subscription. Anyone from the HR department can use the HR uh, cloud. I mean HR subscription that is fine, but they are all put under one group and that is called as the management group. OK, so that it is easy. For the organization to manage the subscription. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's say you have a policy. OK, that uh, people cannot uh, uh, wear um, uh, formal, I mean, informal clothes from Monday to Thursday. Let's say so when you enter and when you go to the uh, organization to work, so it is a policy that is applicable to not just the HR department, but to the sales department, to the marketing department, right? So who has decided this? This has been decided by the organization, correct? And this is then by default inherited by all the departments, correct? Like from Monday to Friday, you have to wear formals. Friday, you can wear casuals, okay? Or probably you're not allowed to smoke in this area. You have to go, there's a space dedicated for smoking, correct? So this is all determined by the management group. So once I decide a policy at the management level, automatically everyone will inherit those policies. So now coming to your Azure perspective. So let's say my organization has a policy that we cannot deploy resources in the Japan region. It is too expensive or OK, or we don't have much customers in the Japan region. So why deploy over there? Apply a policy at this level. OK, so automatically if a sales department tries to create or approach the Japan region, they will not be able to uh, approach that re region, not create any virtual machine, will not be able to create any database, get information from the Japan region. Why? Because a policy has been applied at the management group level. Similarly, HR department cannot recruit people from the Japan region into their office or whatever. OK, so it's just an example that I am giving. So there can be multiple management groups okay, within a single directory. Now, what is a directory here? It is the Azure Active Directory. OK, so there can be multiple groups with that, within that. I will talk about the Azure Active Directory or uh, it is uh, the identity uh, bay and access based service of Azure. OK, it is something that will help you enter Azure. OK, you have the subscription and all, but you need to identify yourself. You need to uh, 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 Azure needs to know what access you have. OK, 
One single management group can have multiple subscriptions. Within that subscription, they can have multiple resource groups. OK, and within that resource groups, they can have multiple resources deployed. So this is how the architecture goes. OK, yeah, it can go six level deep. Yes. Uh, coming to the difference between availability zone and availability sets, I will talk about it in the next module. So just hold on to that. Um, yes, multiple users can have one subscription. Yes, uh, you will have to assign roles. OK, so I will talk about this topic in depth in uh, module three or uh, no, module two. OK, I will tell you all about it. So let's see how to create uh, a module, how to create a resource group uh, on Azure. OK, so I have my portal. Um, so subscription, like I told you, um, a tenant is some like your organization is a tenant of Azure. OK, or um, tenant is basically an instance of the Active Directory. So I have an Active Directory on Azure. OK, I have a uh, identity of my own. So if I want, uh, so I am a tenant basically to that. But a subs with, without a subscription, OK, though I have an account on Azure, without a subscription, I can't use any of the services on Azure. I need to have an access to the subscription, OK? Or if I have been, I have been added to somebody else's subscription, then I become a tenant of that subscription. So you have to so if you, if you have to use a subscription, you need to be a part of that tenant and tenant is nothing but a part of the active directory. OK. This six layer restriction is decided by Azure. It's not in my hand. OK, so let's just quickly see how to create a resource group in Azure. So I have logged into my portal. OK. So this is uh, your Azure portal. If you have an Azure uh, subscription, even free, this is how it will look like. So this is uh, where you can ask for resources, deploy your resources. OK, these are the list of services it has or resources it has. OK, this is the uh, marketplace. Where you can see category wise. Uh, uh, services have been allocated. So if you want to work with AI or machine learning services, you can come here. You can select whatever you want. Now they have this as your open AI as well as your machine learning cognitive services. OK, if you want to work with analytics, if you recall, I was talking about Databricks. So this is an uh, analytical tool. OK, you want to work with Synapse, you can come here. You want to work with Power BI Embedded, you can come here. If you want to work with DevOps, you can come here. You can see, OK, apart from that, there are multiple um, other resources. OK. Um, that are, one second. All of this you can see over here. OK, so this is my marketplace. You can get third party services as well, depending on what you select. OK. All related to billing, what services are there? OK. OK, so this is your marketplace. OK, so which service have you seen recently and all of that you will get information about over here. Now let's create a resource group. So I'm, I'm going to search for it in the resource bar. I mean in the search bar, sorry. Just say resource group. Go for the first option. Select create. So this is my subscription that I have. I'm going to give my resource group a name. So I'm going to give it a webinar. And now I'm just going to click on review plus create. So it will do a basic validation. 
and once it is validated it is click i'm going to click on create so throughout this webinar whatever services i deploy i will be putting it into this resource group so whatever services i create okay will be listed out over here so if you see uh, this uh, resource group that i have so i have these two services which is a storage account and data factory created so i can see them listed over here similarly any other if you see this so these are the services that i have created over here okay so whichever resource you create okay under which subscription it is there all that information you will get it over here okay whether you want to um, you want to give access to this particular resource group you can do that you can check your access give role assignments okay based on roles okay uh, that pers a, pers a specific role like there is an intern okay i will i will talk about this much later okay so this is how you create a simple resource group in azure so with this uh, we bring an end to module 1 Okay. No, Visual Studio. It it is the name of my subscription. So since I'm an MCT, so we get a uh, we get a specific subscription, and that subscription name is the Visual Studio. This thing. So it's a different name. You if you take a free subscription, the name will be different. Okay. So it's not that you have to buy a sub. You have to buy a subscription. Okay. But since I am an MCT, we get. some uh, 7000 uh, uh, rupees a monthly okay so we get different subscription for developer the subscription is different for uh, administrator the subscription is different okay so uh, depending on what certification you do okay you sh should have the capability then to qualify as a microsoft certified trainer and then you will get the uh, appropriate subscription okay but if you are working at an organization level the organization is responsible to buy the subscription for azure okay now let's move on to module 2 yeah i'll just give you break in some time okay we'll just do a little bit of module 2 and then i'll give you the break uh no i will not be uh, showing you all how to set up an account i will share the link for that okay uh, i will uh, not be focusing on how to create an account okay now coming to module 2 module 2 talks about the different services or resources that are there in azure if you want to work with compute what kind of services are there if you want to work with networking what kind of services are there if you want to work with storage identity and access and security okay so that's is that's why i told you all hold on to your questions we will i'll cover them in module 2 so let's start with the compute and networking services in azure so the net to uh, compute services the classic example of a compute service is the virtual machine so a virtual machine is uh, you all know what a virtual machine is it's nothing but a emulation of the physical device okay it's a virtualized de uh, device i can say okay where you are configuring the disk size processors okay uh, what kind of a memory you want whether it should be or what kind of a disk you want is it hdd ssd okay what size what operating system image do you want you decide okay and it's up to you so if you want that flexibility that's what virtual machine brings apart from that apart from that you can have app services kubernetes virtual desktop what are these let's just see one uh, uh uh let's see all of this one at a time okay now coming to the virtual machine so i already told you all virtual machines are nothing but a virtual uh, uh computer okay uh, it's nothing but software emulations of your physical computer 
okay so when you use a physical computer so when you buy a physical computer let's say so what are the things that you look at you look at what virtual machine you on um, sorry what operating system it is how much size of disk it has what is the size of ram what is the size of uh, the rom right then you see how many processors are there what type of a processor is there right so these are the things that you look when you buy any laptop right whether it's dell hp lenovo right so if you want to create a virtual machine, OK, you can do that here as well. OK, and that is like I told you all before, it is nothing but a infrastructure as a service. OK, so this is what so you can create a virtual machine. This is the only service in Azure, which is infrastructure as a service. There is app service, but not much flexibility is there. I will show you all about uh, show how that works. OK, but virtual machine has the highest flexibility in terms of infrastructure okay so let's do one thing i will first create a virtual machine okay uh, and then we will discuss around it okay so i'll just navigate back to my portal uh i will come here I'll search for virtual machine OK, so go for the first option that is there. I'm going to drop down, click on Azure much virtual machine. OK, now I'm going to select the resource group that we created earlier. That is webinar. OK, go. I'm going to give it a name called as VM1. OK, then I'm going to go for. A Windows server windows operating system okay now coming to the size so here you can see here you could configure images there are third party images as well red hat oracle okay debian all of those are there you can even give custom images you can see all the images that are there okay uh pertaining to windows server microsoft 10 11 okay red hat all these images are there available to you so you can see how many pages are there 301 so you can imagine the uh, uh, image images that are there so it's up to you you can configure you can even give a custom image okay for that you need to uh, upload the image and the disk and all of that okay uh, everything uh, you will have to study so if you want to know more about this OK, about this uh, virtual machine, virtual networks and all of that, you can go for a certification called as AZ104. AZ104 is more of administrator role where you can work around uh, the virtual machines, virtual networks, configuration of these virtual machines, security of this virtual machines. All of that comes into picture. So if you want to get trained on that, you can come to us also. OK, or you can get an exam prep session from. us. OK, on that particular certification, OK, uh, you can study on your own. I will share the links from where you can study everything I will do towards the end. So now here you can see there are different disk sizes. You can configure which disk you want. So if you click on this, you can see all the types of disk A, D, B, F, E, all those series are there. OK, what are managed disk, unmanaged disk, all of that you can find out over here. So I'm going to go with the uh, uh, default one that is being given to me. OK. Then uh, sorry, yeah, this is the size of the disk. So you can see only one CPU uh, V core has been allocated to me and this is the memory size and what is the size uh, cost it is going to incur for me on a monthly basis. So now here I'm going to give a username and password because when you log into your own laptop, if you recall, you give it a username and a password. OK, so it's the same thing that I'm doing over here. OK. Then you can even select which ports you want to uh, want uh, people to access this particular virtual machine. OK, so I'm RDP. I'm going I will go for HTTP as well. OK, so if 
any uh, request is coming from HTTP, okay, you, you will allow it, okay. Then you can come here, you can manage the disk. So currently it is using SSD. You can go for HDD, okay. Uh, select for what type you want. So I'm going to go for HDD, cheaper option, that is why, as of now. Okay, so but there are many other options. You can go for premium SSD. You can go for uh, depending on the zone. I'll talk about this. Okay, but since um, uh, it's local, I'm going to stick to this. Then coming to networking, you can configure the network. Okay, so by default, a virtual network is created. Okay, uh, let's say you want to create one more virtual machine in this same network. You can do that. Okay, we I'll show you how to do that as well. OK, so these are certain configurations that you can do on your own. OK, and now I'm going to say, um, yeah, before that. So if you recall, uh, we have these availability zones. OK, so. Let's say your virtual machine for some reason has is not working in this particular region. OK, or in this particular availability zone. OK, so you can select whatever uh, availability options you want one so a virtual machine has three options one is the availability zone second is the vm scale set and third is the availability set okay so what is an availability zone i've already told you all okay so a vm of the same uh, size configuration will be replicated onto an other availability zone OK, uh, or sorry, you get the option to select which availability zone you want within the region. So in East US, like I told you, there are only three availability zones. So you want this VM to be created in availability zone one or in two or in three. You get an option. OK, so this is what is the availability zone uh, that is there. Then you have VM scale sets. So I will I will talk about this later. OK, and availability sets as well. So now I'll just uh, create this. So let it create. So we'll talk about the VM scale sets and the availability sets. So one way is uh, that you create uh, for your availability so that this machine is highly available is through the availability zone. OK, the other way is uh, the VM scale sets. Now, what is VM scale sets? Um, if you have an your VM, let's say, is undergoing a fault domain, OK, is uh, is experiencing some uh, failure, OK? is experiencing some failure because uh, of some uh, reason, OK? Uh, there is a, a, the electricity has gone down or something like that, OK? Um, I'll rather show a diagram here. So I told you all, this is a region, OK? And inside a region, you have three availability zones. So you get an option to select which availability zone you want to deploy your virtual machine, OK? That is one way. Now, in an available, now consider this to be an availability zone, OK? Let's say this is availability zone one. OK. And inside each availability zone, like I told you, there are data centers, correct? One or two or three, it depends.
okay and within the data centers i told you there are racks correct so let's say uh, you have um, uh, you have created a virtual machine okay and your virtual machine uh, azure has decided will it will deploy on let's say availability zone 1 and on rack 1 Okay, so let's say your VM has been deployed on this particular rack. Okay. Now, when I say, when I select availability set, so now what does availability set mean? Okay, availability set is nothing but fault domain and made up of update domain. Okay, so now my VM has been created on this particular rack, correct? So what if this seeing some failure? Okay, what if or probably this rack the servers on this rack are undergoing some maintenance or undergoing some update on the firmware side. Then what will happen to my VM? Will it be available to me? Yes, guys, will it be available to me? You think it will be available to you? If I, if this particular rack let's say is is has undergone some uh, failure or is undergoing some updates okay so do you think this particular vm will be available to you no right it will not be available to you so in that case what happens your vm is not available to you the high availability feature of vm will be will not be available to you so if i want my vm to be available to me and i go for the availability set option okay instead of availability zone okay so what will availability set do it will create a copy or replicate my vm on some other rack of the data center or probably in within the same as your within the same uh, zone but on the other data center it will create a copy of my vm now if this particular rack goes down will my vm still be available to me will my vm be still available right so this is what is the concept of availability set, okay? So this is what is availability set. So availability set will make a copy of your VM within the same zone, but either in the same data center or in another data center, but within the same availability zone, okay? So this is what is availability set. So it is made up of fault and update domain. But when I talk about availability zone, if I go for availability zone kind of uh, availability option, then what happens is my VM will be created on one data center. Apart from that, it will be replicated on the other availability zone, okay, on the other data center of availability zone 2, okay, and even availability zone 3, let's say. So if you go for this option, okay, then what if you go for this option? What will happen if this entire availability zone goes down? Okay, so now 
remember in availability set if this availability zone goes down then you have no chance of recovering your your vm will not be available to you okay but if i go for availability zone i have my availability i have my vm available on az2 correct and on az3 Okay, it will be available to me on is on this particular zone. I'll just jump right. Yeah, it will be available to me. It will be available over here. as well as in uh, availability zone three so i'll get an option to select okay where i can manage or keep my availability keep my vm in which availability zone if you select two then it will be replicated in these two regions if you select three it will be replicated in uh, in the other two availability zones so this is how availability zone works and this is how availability set works so remember availability set will not be able to help you at a zonal level recovery but an availability zone will help you to recover or uh, make your vm available at a zonal level as well okay region level then the entire thing i like i told you will be paired with some other region okay so your data, your VM will be backed up then. Okay. So this is what is the difference between availability zone and availability set. Okay. Availability set is pertaining to a data center and availability zone is pertaining to the zones within the region. So availability set will be available only in that zone, whereas availability zone is in terms of all the zones within the region. Okay. Now comes the concept of the uh, VM scale set. So what are VM? So if your primary VM is down, okay, it will be you have a backup already created. So it will uh, there will be little downtime, okay, till the time the other VM is, you know, uh will uh, start will be uh, start you know it will start uh, bring it to operation it takes time right so that that's the only downtime it will face and you can then all your operations will be moved to that particular vm so this is what is the uh concept of availability zone and availability set So fault domain is when your uh, rack, when your data center is undergoing some failure. Okay, um, you can uh, like electricity is not available to that rack, or probably uh, there is some server issue. Okay, or there is a flood that has occurred on that data center, some water has entered, or something like that. That's when a failure happens. So that is called as fault domain. But if the server has to undergo, uh, yeah, I'm not sharing anything. So if your server has to undergo any uh, updates, okay, from one version to another version, okay, or firmware update or any other update that it has to do, then it is called as the update domain. Okay. So availability set and availability zone. So like I told you, availability, I can't actually give you a real example. You can consider a website. Okay, let's say you have deployed. You have gone for availability set option. Okay, it's up to you. It's what you decide. So like I told you, this is an infrastructure as a service. So you can, um, uh, it's up to you what option you want to go for. Okay, if you go for availability zone, your uh, a VM will be not just available in zone one. You can put it into zone two or three. It's up to you. Okay. 
apart from that availability stack will be pertaining to only a data center okay uh, it is pertaining to a data center only there is no other way in which you can recover your data if that data center fails but in an availability zone because you have backed up you have other two zones you can back up your or uh, you know you can have your vm created over there uh, no i would not call it as a subset over here okay because in availability set it can be uh, your data will be backed up in another data center within the same zone but in an availability zone your your uh, vm will be put into some other data center of some other zone okay so that's what uh, is availability zone and availability set. okay so i think our vm is created yeah so let's just access our vm see how to access our vm so here you can see the deployment is successful so let's go to the resource so let's connect to the vm okay so there are three ways in which you can connect to the vm your one second Okay, they have made a lot of changes. Yeah. There are four ways in which you can connect. One is using the RDP, that is the remote desktop protocol. Okay. Then you have Bastion, you have something called as Windows Center. And now I think they've introduced these two currently. Okay. That is the serial console and the Windows Admin Center. These are other two ways in which you can interact with your VM. Okay, and the other way is the secure shell. Okay, uh, through which you can connect. You will get a certification, certificate key, and all of that through which you can connect. Okay, so these are the four ways or five ways, I would say, uh, through which you can connect to your uh, virtual machine. Okay, so we are going to use the RDP method. So I'm just going to go for this. I'm going to download the RDP file. Say keep. So once it opens, I'll click on open. So this is how you can. Uh, this is how you can see it will be downloaded. This RDP file will be downloaded. Okay. So I will go to downloads. Click over here. I'll say connect. So if you recall, we had created a user ID password. Just say you will enter those details over here. And click on OK. Say yes. So now you can see you have entered the virtual machine environment. This is a Windows operating uh, image. You can see, okay, since we have selected East US, the timing is, uh, so this is the timing it is showing, okay. Okay, so I'll just close this session and click on. Okay. Okay, so this is how you can create a simple VM in Azure. Yeah, so you can see instead of the challenges that one would face in a virtual box that I told you, okay, it happens within 
minutes you just need a good internet connection okay and you can easily create a virtual machine okay um for, uh, and you don't have to worry about the physical configurations of your laptop or anything okay i'm not sharing my screen okay uh, and you can get a virtual machine created okay so you can see how easy it is to use cloud and to create a virtual machine okay so now it's almost 1 30 okay we'll take a, a lunch break okay for one hour why you need azure azure is not a virtual box it is a cloud service keep that in mind it is not a virtual box virtual box is something that you need if you want a, another operating system for that earlier one would need a virtual box but nowadays you can just you just need a cloud subscription and you can create a, a virtual machine on the internet it's basically like creating a service on the internet no you if you recall we entered a username and password so that's the account that you can use in order to uh, you know uh, the same user id password you can use in order to connect to the vm via rdp yes vm is the resource that we have created yes so we so if i come to my portal okay um so if you come to resource groups and come to webinar so you can see the vm created inside this resource group okay so my resource group is webinar so you can see if i come to vm you can see all the information you can see the resource group where it has been deployed okay which subscription id under what subscription which region i have deployed what operating system i have okay all of this you can get what is the size of the disk all that information is listed over here what is the public ip address private ip address will not be displayed over here you will have to go to the connect and you will have to see for it okay so this is what is basically a virtual machine how easy it was to create a virtual machine No, people will, you will have to give access to those people, okay, in order to use a virtual machine, you will have to give them the access. No one can uh, come and access your virtual machine, just like that, okay? So anyone who has internet connection, not possible, they need to have the IP address and all of that, okay? This, I am not aware, it is uh, as your, uh, that is it's uh, as yours proprietary so i can't actually answer this question what virtualization they are using okay what technology are they are using so i cannot answer that no uh, vm um this vm actually yes will belong to one resource group you can put it into some other resource group but you can't change the region like if you have created in east us it will stay in east us Okay, you can put it into some other resource group. That is fine, but you'll have to see how to uh, change the resource group. Okay, uh, but the region will remain the same where you have created this. Yeah, I will be giving you the document. I will share the links. Okay, and of course, this recording will be available to you. Okay, once uh, we are done for today. Okay, so let's do one thing, guys. Uh, let's take a quick, uh, like, let's not, I mean, let's take an hour long uh, 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 lunch break. Okay, and once that is done, we will resume this session. Okay, so it's 1 30. Let's meet at 2 30. Okay, and uh, resume the training.